glasses. He wears That's glasses. Right. And, and he'd be, he'd be at the mic like this. And he'd be saying, for goodness sake, get yourself together. And his eyes would be going over the, over yeah. the top of the glasses. It's, it's, um, diluting, yeah. diluting the vitriol. Paula from Chesenham, amazing amount of ladies uh, emailing tonight saying how sad they are and, uh, and how much they're going to miss him. Uh, says, I will miss you, Mike, because I only listen to talk sport for your calming, witty voice. I love and miss you. Now, uh, of course, uh, we all had lots and lots of guests on our programme, and one guest that I shared with Mike a lot was former Tory MP. I used to refer to him on my television show as the Golden Golly, which uh, apparently was not very politically correct, but I couldn't give a stuff, <laughs> nor could Mike. Uh, it was the legendary Jerry Hayes. Hiya, Jerry. Hiya, Whaley. How are you? Oh, sad, actually. Nice to speak to you, but really sad, because I was on the train last night, and I picked up... Uh, of the London newspaper, and uh, saw about Mike's death. So first thing I did was ring you, find well, out what was going on. Um, and, and what a yeah, it's sad. And, and as I said, I don't want to harp on it no. being sad. I want to harp on the on the great things that this planet has uh, been left uh, by the fact we have Mike on the radio. Um, and you you used to be a guest on his show a lot, didn't you? Oh, a hell of a lot. I mean, Long I before LBC, I met you. LBC. You know, it was a proper station in those days. <laughs> uh, it wasn't he knows what to say, doesn't he? Various <laughs> management. Um, and, uh, oh, gosh, Gough Square. But after Gough Square, I remember one particular incident at Hammersmith. Um, um, we used to go across to one of the pubs and, you know, have a f- quite a few drinks. Can I, can I, just before we go any further, sorry yeah. about this, Jerry. Yeah. I mean, we don't want to, people to think that, that all Mike did was drink. <laughs> well, of course he did. He was um, a- but he was a cracking good bloke. But about 15 hours of every day. So, I mean, there was time that, that, yeah. 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 <laughs> and <laughs> we're just as bad. So, anyway, go yeah, on. Yeah, good. Yeah. But there was this, fa- this famous story uh, at the, the Hammersmith headquarters. There was a big party. Uh, Mike had had far too much to drink. So, what did he do? He <laughs> slept in the managing director of LBC's <laughs> office. Uh, fell asleep. Uh, but, of course, completely chucked up all over the front of his desk and all over the wall and all over the sofa. <laughs> And uh, he didn't like him very much, so he didn't clear it up. <laughs> now, <laughs> most that, mortals was, like us would be sacked for that. That no was the inspiration ever. for that storyline in Drop the Dead Donkey. That was the inspiration? That was the event. Yeah. 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 On, Absolutely yeah. true as well. Well, we, should we all share our, 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 our um, stories about Mike like that? Well, OK, one little one here. I don't know where Ashes has disappeared, but he'll come back in a moment. Um, one night, commercial break, Mike was coming on after me i went out into the studio and he'd obviously been out somewhere he'd come back and sometimes he used to come back and just sort of sleep at the radio station Mm. um and then after he finished his program he'd drive back down to cornwall and he'd come in and uh, he was sitting in a chair at the desk and i went up and said hello mike how's it going nothing nothing i prodded him i said mike mike I I, i came rushing back in here i said ash ash quick God, I think Mike's expired at his desk. We put on another commercial break, ran back outside, pushing him. Mike, wake up, wake up. And we couldn't get any anything out of him at all. Anything out of him at all. Now, we didn't know what to do at this stage. We yeah. thought, well, should we ring the boss and say, look, I don't know what's going to go on. We, d- we decided not to because we knew the boss would say, well, look, I can't get anyone to do the program now. You're just going to have to stay on. So... We kept going back and trying to wake him up. Luckily, at 15 minutes before the end of our show, strange, as, as if by a miracle, he began, began to come round. <laughs> you must have been sitting there thinking, <coughs> this is the worst night of my life. And then, uh, I, I thought, I'll, I'll do the first half hour to get him going. I, I went out and I said, uh, right. He said, right. What do you mean, right? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm ready. I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm okay. I said, well, I'll do, I'll do half an hour. Get yourself together, mate. Have a, have a... No, don't be so stupid. No, 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 no. So he went in and he did the show. And you couldn't have told. He'd just woken up after a long hibernation. <laughs> a long hibernation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it was just... It, it was... <sighs> life... Life would be so, so depressing without people like Mike, wouldn't it? Yeah. But it reminds me, do you remember Pete Murray when he was in Gough Square doing LBC? He used to suddenly just wander off uh, in the middle of the advertising break, and you'd be the guest on your own. <laughs> and he'd have taken his teeth out. 
and left them on the table. <coughs> well, I suppose thinking, you can be quietly well, confident he wasn't going to whistle for a cat. What the hell do I do? Can I take off his prayer? I don't know what to do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and then he'd, wa- he'd come back with about three seconds to spare, shove his teeth in and go on as yeah. normal. <laughs> I always thought that Pete Murray and Mike Dickin together would have made a great show. Oh, it would fantastic, yeah. Listen, good to talk to you, my friend. Nice to see you, man. And good, uh, see you soon. Cheers. Bye. Jerry Hayes, uh, now, of course, uh, coining in fortunes, absolute fortunes, um, as a barrister. Do you know that's what he's doing now? He's a barrister. That's a good gig. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very nice. Very nice if you can do it. The nice thing about it is you sort of grow into it, so when you're about uh, 60 or 65, you probably look even better. Yeah. Good thing about Jerry Hayes, actually, and uh, Dickin would have said this, I'm sure, is that he doesn't need a wig. To be no. a barrister, because he's got that tight, curly, white hair. Is it white now? Well, I should imagine so, yeah. I haven't seen him for a while, but I, I imagine yeah. it is. Nice bit it was yellow, so, I mean, it would go yeah. white. It wouldn't go black, would it? No. No. No, I didn't think it would. Sort of John Deeds of speech radio. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's talk up, uh, take another call. I think we've got time now. George in Swansea. Hello, George. Good evening, sir. Hello, my friend. Uh, I just want to give a tribute to Mike, because I was shocked uh, at the news... And what annoyed me was that uh, I, I heard it on uh, the news on, on Talk Sport Monday morning, mm. and uh, and um, uh, then I started surfing the sea facts, and I didn't see anything mentioned. I didn't hear anything mentioned on BBC or all the twenty-four hour news or anything. I thought that was despicable. But let me tell you something else. Twenty-five years ago, I started listening to uh, talk radio. Then, yeah. And uh, I used to listen to Mike Dickin, and I thought to myself, he had a very similar voice to Gilbert Harding, you know. Uh, uh, Absolutely, yes. And yes. he also had a lot of Gilbert Harding's uh, attitudes, you know. He, nobody could beat him in an <laughs> argument, as far as I was concerned. A and dry- I didn't know until tonight that he died in a car crash. Yeah, yes. Yeah, well, I was amazed at that, because he was mad on cars. Yeah. Cars was part of his life. He and loved he, cars. You are absolutely right. Yes, can't, and can't. the other thing, the other thing I want to tell you is this: about uh, about uh, just over a week ago, I got on about him because he was talking about antisocial behaviour with the youngsters. Yeah. And I went through a litany of things that had happened in Wales and and all over the country by twelve-year-olds, eleven-year-olds raping girls and God knows what. And he totally agreed with what I said because I said it was when the government stop the use of the canes in the classroom and when uh, parents could no, no longer give their children a smack. Oh, he would have agreed with that, George. Yes, and he did. Good man. And the final thing I want to say about And he Mike, was absolutely right. Yes, and the final thing I want to say about Mike Dickin is this, that he was a great man and the last time I heard him, I think it was Saturday or Sunday night, he had, incidentally, I've got the book, he had the author... Uh, Richard uh, Dawkins on his show and um, I, I tried a couple of times and I was waiting too long and I, I couldn't get on to talk to them because I, I'd already bought the uh-huh. book I'd already bought my, my, my uh, Richard Dawkins book and um, when Richard Dawkins left he carried on talking to different people ringing in but there was one chap that rang in and he said God created the universe and uh, Mike Dickin said, well, what was there before that? He said, there was nothing. And Mike Dickin said to him, well, how could God be there if there was nothing? And the chap couldn't answer him. He said, how? He got really uptight in it. In the end, he put the phone, he, he, he said, that nutcase, he's a nutter. <laughs> that made me laugh. But he was a great man, and he's. I don't know how he can be replaced in, uh, uh, by somebody, because I only listen to you and Mike Dickin. I don't listen, uh-huh. I've listened a couple of times to that uh, well, fella go George, away. With that, George, I don't think we'll go quite into that, but uh, thank you for your thoughts on Mike Dickin uh, tonight. Uh, and obviously, George and Mike are uh, kindred spirits, I would have thought, in many ways. There's, there's a lot going on there, especially when it comes to the, the kiss of the birch. Yeah, and I, you know, it, uh, we've lost discipline, and Mike would tell you, and Mike would say on his program, there's no discipline now, there's no... Uh, we're, we're full of political correctness, and uh, uh, which is why I, I think Mike enjoyed staying down in Cornwall and then going to his house over in France as well. And I think... Uh, I, I was looking through sort of uh, some of the things here that uh, Mike enjoyed, <laughs> a list of things that Mike, uh, Mike enjoyed, and I, I've got it somewhere. I can't find it at the moment, I'll find it. 
um, in, and uh, it was uh, it was uh, some some uh, some interesting th- things that you wouldn't have uh, uh, been surprised about, and I'll uh, I'll read them out when I can find them a little later. Now we're coming up towards the news, and because there has been uh, some uh, some uh, some Break- happenings, breakthroughs. some uh, breakthroughs in the uh, Ipswich uh, murders, I think we might have a slightly longer news. Don't go away. On 1089 and 1053 AM, James Whale on Talk Sport. Kiki D and Elton John, and uh, it's nice to welcome Kiki to the programme tonight. Kiki, good evening to you. How are you, darling? I'm very well, sweetie. How are you? Not too bad. I'm a bit bit in shock to hear about Mike. Very, very sad. Very, very sad. Particularly sad at this time of year. But we want to make it a bit of a celebration of his life tonight. Okay. And the the three, over three decades he spent on the radio. And you you met him a few times, didn't you? Went on his programme a few times. You knew him quite well. Yeah, um, about three years ago, um, he called me um, and wanted to come and see me play in Liscard, um, in down in Cornwall. Uh-huh. That's his neck of the woods down there. That's right. It? So he came along with his wife, Karen, and we had a really nice night, and we kept in touch. We spoke about twice a year, you know. And uh, he called me a couple of weeks before Christmas, you know, left a message, mm. and... Um, you know, we've sort of clicked, and he was very, very sportive towards me and told me he used to play my records in the 70s, you know. <laughs> it was really nice. I was trying to think, the, um, <clears throat> the, you're, in, you're in actually uh, Austria at the moment, are you? I'm in Austria, yes, I am, yeah. So you're, uh, you're, you're touring, or you're... Having... I, I'm actually on holiday, I'm, I'm, I'm on a skiing holiday. Oh, well, that's all right, isn't it? Yeah, it's there's, lovely. I'm, I'm there's probably snow. a skier, but I'm having a great time. It's beautiful here. Well, Absolutely Kiki, beautiful. I know that everybody has been shocked uh, that, that uh, Mike sadly died on Monday. And uh, he, was, he was one of those guys who was slightly different to the norm, wasn't he, as far as people on the radio were concerned. He wasn't the sort of person you would first have expected to find working um, in that field. We, we, we've spoken to people today who've said that uh, Mike was really happy in, uh, in his big Wellingtons and his barber jacket <laughs> and uh, taking the dogs for long walks. Well, actually, yes, because I, I, you know, I'd listened to him on on talk on talk um, before he rang me that time, you know, three years ago, and and when I got the message saying he'd rung, you know, I thought, oh gosh, you know, <laughs> what's he going to be like? And when he came to the gig, he was so sweet and and so sort of down to earth, and really, it's kind of really lovely actually. And uh, we hit it off, as I said earlier, and. Um, you know, I also had a great deal of respect for him as a broadcaster, as I do for you, actually. Oh, Kiki. Uh, I often listen to you guys late at night coming back from a gig, you know. I was trying to, um, I, I was remembering the, when <clears throat> I was talking about uh, seeing whether you come on tonight, remembering the first time I talked to you in the 70s, I think, up in Newcastle. Yeah. And you were playing Newcastle City Hall, weren't you? God, we go back, eh? Well, yes, but you seem to have worn better than uh, Mike and I have. Uh, oh, that's bless for, you. That's for sure. Um, anyway, listen, you enjoy your, your skiing holiday. I just want to send my commiserations out to, to Mike's family and to all his supporters and everybody at Talk Radio. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Kiki. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Kiki D. Um, I've not heard her speak much until tonight. You know, not about the opportunity, and she's got a very nice voice, a lot of mm. compassion. Very nice. 
Lovely voice. Very good songs. Oh, brilliant. And do you know I never knew Mike was a fan? Yes, I do. You see, I never knew Mike was, was private, a fan. and he yeah. just kept certain things close. Listen, let's play a bit, let's play a bit more of, uh, of Mike's music. We haven't done that. And, uh, from one, uh, sexy rock siren to another. He was a huge, huge fan of Vinegar Joe. Um, <clears throat> Vinegar, do you remember Vinegar Joe? Yeah, Island yeah. Records. Island Records. Um, and also, that means, of course, their lead singer was Elkie Brooks. And I thought it'd be nice maybe to play a little bit of music from Elkie Brooks. And uh, one of the best, of course, Elkie Brooks songs ever, and I'm sure Mike enjoyed this one, was called Fool If You Think It's Over. <laughs> Elkie Brook, Fool If You Think It's Over. And uh, Elkie Brook, of course, in Elkie's early days, she was the lead singer of uh, a band called Vinegar Joe, who I loved as well, and uh, they were one of Mike's favourites. So we thought uh, during the programme tonight we would put a couple of uh, uh, of Mike's favourite pieces of music in. Uh, this is the tribute show from... Uh, I don't know what's happened there. I'm losing... Uh, oh, I see. You see, it's... Uh, you know that button that keeps going off, and if um, yeah. it's started again, you imagine... Is it Mike got some sort of influence on here? You know when things go wrong. I think wrong I'm going to have to come over there in a minute, James. No, it's, it's, it's got a, it's, uh, it's got a, a it's restrain got, him. Mike. It's got a, a sort of mind of its own. Some of this equipment, I must tell you. Uh, right, we're going to talk to uh, Michael Van Stratton, who was uh, another guest on um, uh, on Mike's show as well, and uh, we're also going to talk to Cyril from Abingdon in Oxfordshire, who knew Mike uh, before he actually started working on radio. We'll talk to Cyril right after this. Ho, ho, ho. This is Talk Sport. Um, Bill's in Leicestershire. Bill, good evening on Talk Sport. Hello, Mike. Hi. How you doing? Uh, I, I never heard your topic tonight for a phone up. Uh, in that case, we'll say goodbye, Bill. But no, no, please. Why? Well, I mean, there's no point in you phoning up if you haven't heard what we're talking about, just on the off chance you get on the air. Lots of people actually been waiting to get on because they feel involved in what's being said. You just dial a phone in number and think you've got the right to go on the air. Well, you bloody well haven't. The ability to dial the number is not enough to get you on the radio. You have to have a brain. You have to have a mouth and a connection between the two called intellect. You clearly have neither. Goodbye. Absolutely right. You tell him. Andy Marshall. Hi, Andy. Thank you for your email. Andy has emailed us tonight. If you would like to email, it's talksport.net. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of people are doing that tonight. This one says, uh, James, maybe this is too late for the show, but if you get the chance, could you please mention how wonderful it was to meet Mike at my brother's pub, which is the... Uh, Billsland Inn in Bodmin, and I think uh, Mike used it as his local. He will be sorely missed by all your listeners, including my family. May he rest in peace and inspiration to people who understood the real world in which we live. God bless him. Uh, and a lot of affection, a lot of affection tonight. Yeah, yeah. and uh, let's talk to Cyril now. In uh, uh, Mr. Van Stratton, well, worry not, we're coming to you after this. Uh, Cyril, who is in uh, Abingdon in Oxfordshire. Hi, Cyril. Hello, James. How are you? I'm good, Cyril. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, what's going on? Well, you, you were inquiring what Mike done before he became a broadcaster. I was. We were actually apprentices together at the MG Car Company in Abingdon. Uh, he was an engineer and apprentice. Really? He was, yeah. I, I can tell you an amusing story about Mike. Go on. Um, there was a rag week organised, um, and all the local apprentices took part in this rag week. And as you can imagine, most of the stunts uh, involved uh, drinking considerable amounts of alcohol. After one of these, Mike decided to climb a radio mast, would you believe, <laughs> which put the blimmin' ra the, the mast out of kilter. And uh, <laughs> everybody in the area couldn't get the reception on the radio afterwards. <laughs> so, you know, quite ironical that he actually uh, went into radio uh, as a career afterwards, you know. Did you? Did he ever say that that's what he wanted to do or not? No. No, to be honest, it came as a complete shock to everybody. He finished his apprenticeship and the next we heard he was on um, Radio Oxford, you know. And it really was a talk of the factory. And did you ever see him after that? Yeah. Yeah, a few times, and I actually spoke to him uh, on LBC. We were in, living in Harrow at the time, uh -huh. and uh, we, he was actually talking about practical jokes and all that, and, and I rang up and we, we uh, recounted some of the things that happened to apprentices uh, in those days, you know. And did he admit to the fact he climbed the radio Sorry? mast? Did he admit to the fact that he climbed the radio mast? Um, 
I think he was always a bit embarrassed about it, to be honest. I don't know if you ever mentioned it to anybody else. He was made to pay for the, um, the, the mass to be put right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Maybe that's when he, he, uh, he realised that that was the career for him in it broadcasting. Like it, yeah, yeah, he was going right to the top, as it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps that's where he also developed his love of motor cars. It, well, that's right. Uh, absolutely right, yeah. Yeah. Cyril, thank you very much indeed. Nice oh, talking with you. Shame it's such sad circumstances. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Um, so we're un unravelling some of the story and bits that we Still didn't know about. You see, this yeah. is the side of Mike that none of us knew. Now, here's a man that we all know who we've had on programmes from time to time and a man that Mr Dickin had. In fact, a man who claims to have got Mr Dickin started on radio. Uh, the legendary Michael Van Stratton. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm OK, thank you very much indeed. Good. But very sad. Yeah, it's a sad, it's a sad time, but, but uh, we you know, if anybody chose to uh, finish his life abruptly and suddenly like that, it would have been Mike. I couldn't imagine anybody who would have been a worse person, who would have hated to have been a, an a elderly, doddery, infirm invalid who couldn't do everything for himself. He would have hated that. He would have hated that. You're absolutely yeah. right. And uh, he, um, uh, we, we, from time to time, because we all get a bit morbid, we, we used to talk about uh, uh, what it would be like to die on the air. Well, I mean, it's just one of those things that, that uh, you do. Particularly if you work at night, Michael, you often think, well, maybe I'll just have a seizure and... Well, that's right. That's right. But, in fact, <coughs> it was amazing, my, 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 uh, my connection with Mike, because... Uh, I didn't live too far from Oxford, and v when he took over at, uh, at Radio Oxford, took over the afternoon show, um, he inherited me. <laughs> as one of his I kids. remember inheriting you and once. I've been doing uh, for a few months. I've been doing a sort of a you know once a month yeah. uh, phone in on the show with his predecessor there, and uh, we got on very well because he was. Uh, as you know, he was a, he, he was an amazing guy, and and, uh, and even in those very early days, I'm talking over thirty years ago, he was. What was a he like? What was he like he, as a young thirty uh, thirty odd year old guy? <laughs> he wasn't quite as acerbic as he became later. Uh, he wasn't quite the sort of angry man of the radio that he that he became. Uh -huh. But he was a person who had this uncanny knack of putting his finger right on the button of the public's feelings and the public's opinions. And he, he would, even then, get very angry when people had been badly treated. We used to get calls from people who'd been waiting nine months to see a doctor and you know, four years for their operation. And this is, as I say, 30-odd years ago. It wasn't any better then. And uh, he would get very angry and, 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 and very upset on their behalf and, and very involved with the callers. But the strange thing was that having done this show with him for several months at Oxford, uh, he he just he vanished. Somebody else took over. I wasn't quite sure what had happened to him. And then one night, late one night, I get this phone call. Uh, oh, Mike, it's uh, it's Mike Dickin. Oh, hi, Mike, how are you? He said, look, I'm in the SH1T, he said. <laughs> but I've just started doing the nighttime show at LBC. And in those days, of course, LBC was the, uh, it was the first uh, of the commercial radio stations. It was, yeah. And it was the only speech commercial station. And uh, he'd taken over this sort of flagship nighttime show, which, which had a huge audience, I mean, enormous audience in those days. Mm. And he said, look, I, I've only just started here. I've been here two weeks. I got a guest booked who's just phoned up to say he can't come. Can you get here in 20 minutes? I said, well, for you, of course I can get there in 20 minutes. And uh, I was then, from that minute on, I was at LBC for 30 years. Uh, every week with Mike for months and months as long as he, when he, as long as he did that show. And, um, and, and then shortly after, uh, a program of my own. So uh, it was entirely due to him. And that one late night call, uh, somebody let him down, uh, which was my good fortune. Uh, it certainly changed my life. And the fact that he thought of me and thought, oh, well, what mug can I get to come in this time of night who'll be able to put a word or two together and, and, and not, you know, not let me down. And I was extremely lucky, and, and we were... He was easy to work with on the air, wasn't he? Oh, extremely. He was such a professional. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he, he just went to let the, the caller uh, go on, especially when you're doing health phone -ins. It's very, very hard when you have presenters who uh, want to hurry on, who's... who's whose measure of their success is the number of calls they get through in a uh -huh. programme. Mike was very sensitive to people's needs. I mean, if he thought somebody was just swinging the lead and wasting time, he'd pull the plug. 
uh, after all, he'd, he'd, he'd uh, you know, he'd, he'd come to LBC to be the sort of angry man of radio, and um, he wouldn't tolerate the sort of stupidity um, in rather the same way that Mr. Whale has the same mantle. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Anyway, listen, it's been nice to talk to you, Mr. Van Stratton, uh, oh, and Mr. My Alan. Pleasure. And very, very fond memories of, uh, of Mike Dickin. And he'll be sadly missed by an awful lot of people. All right, my friend. Thank you very much indeed for your You're time. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. I was witness to Michael Van Stratton being at that station at one afternoon. Yeah. And Mike used to have a back problem. And he came out of the studio and he said, thank God you're here. He said, can you do my back for me? And Mike, who, Michael Van Stratton, who is absolutely magic when it comes to putting back straight, just li almost lifted him off the ground, which is quite a feat, you know, because <laughs> he was a big chap, Mike Dickin. And you heard his back go, click. And he said, oh, that's lovely. Thanks very much, Mike. Walked straight back <laughs> in the studio. And it, and, and it all happened in the time it takes to tell it. It was just magic to see. Had to go to accident and emergency the next day, but for that, <laughs> he was fine. But that crack. <laughs> Uh, I just trying you to didn't have to dump yourself. <laughs> I, thought I, should, I thought I should dump myself then. <laughs> in the interest of uh, paying off the, uh, the, 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 the I, no, I can't. I mean, Mike, Mike, Mike would find that um, Mike would find that funny, but other people would find it. I must stop doing that. You see, I can't. That's one of the other things Mike used to do. Is uh, the first things that would come into his mind. Quite often, like me, he would say, mm. uh, which makes for a more entertaining program. Yes, but tonight, of course, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Uh, difficult keep, for 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 me and any of us on radio with our enormous egos to take keep, a back seat. Keep the lawyers' bills down. Yeah, exactly. I don't yeah. think it was that bad. No. Um, now, another of another uh, colleague of ours and Mike's, of course, um, was the uh, the amazing Angela Rippon, who uh, who joins me now. Angela, good evening to you. Yeah, good evening to you, James. How are you? I'm extremely well, thank you. Good, good, but good. Very good. sad, obviously, to have, to have heard about Mike's death. Yes, I know, and it, it's, it, uh, I think that I, I, I'm trying not to be sad. I'm trying to to, to keep things up as we're we're talking about him uh, tonight, mm. um, uh, which is what he would want, of course. He wasn't really uh, one of those people who went in much for uh, wearing your heart on your sleeve. Oh uh, no, no, he didn't. I mean, he he wore a lot of other things on his sleeve, but never his heart. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm I, not even going to pursue that, Angela. Yes, I mean, I, I just heard the end of um, um, Mike Van Stratton talking to you there, and, and of course, like like him, I, I knew Mike from LBC. I mean, I knew him before then, of course, because we have um, West Country connections. His home was in Cornwall, yeah. and for many years I lived just over the border in Devon, and so our paths would cross when he was down here. So when we actually met properly when we were at LBC working together, we, we already had that common interest in the countryside and, and country living. And I think people perhaps will find it odd that, and, and not really associate Michael with being someone who really enjoyed living in Cornwall. He loved that country life. His home was just on the edge of Dartmoor, you know, right out in the middle yeah. of nowhere, practically. And he loved that, even though he was on national radio, local radio, and was talking to hundreds of thousands, millions of people. He loved the solitude of Bodmin Moor, and I think that was a side of him that people perhaps didn't know. I could never understand. He used to commute. I mean, he didn't commute every day. Right. Um, but then sometimes he would. He would come up. He said, oh, I've got some stuff to do tomorrow. I'm going back tonight after the show. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean you're going back tonight after the show? He said, no, I'm going back, I'm going back down to Cornwall. I'll be back tonight. Yes. Yes, he would. He, would, he did that, and, they, and of course, and he would. He did a lot of motoring writing, of course, as well, yeah, which is, yeah. and, and loved to motor. But I think the thing that, that I loved about Mike was, I know that he he made his reputation being a kind of shock jock. Um, but when you were with him, and you will know this as well as anybody, but when you were with him socially, he had those amazing attitudes and opinions. I mean, he could be right-wing, left-wing, and extreme. In, <laughs> ab unbelievable. I mean, he could swing from one to the other. And But he would do it for effect. And when he was on the air, he was doing it for a living. Yeah. But when you were with him socially, he would do it for effect. And he could laugh at himself. I mean, he could take the mickey out of himself, something terrible. And he was... I, I loved spending downtime with him. I loved the social time that we had together because he was such great company. He was a terrific raconteur. He had a wonderful memory for things. And and he was just great fun to be with. And I think the other thing about him that, that I think is, is for me a sadness is that although he was a, a, an award-winning journalist and was and was a great journalist and, and, and the audiences loved him, I don't think that, that our profession, that, that, that people who 
have the responsibility for giving people on the air the opportunity of, of doing great programs. I don't think that management always totally appreciated the quality of his journalism. He was a great journalist. You know, he didn't mm. win awards for nothing. He won them because he was really good at what he did. And, and I'm not sure that he always got the recognition that he deserved for that. No, I think uh, I, I think I would agree with you. I think that, that sometimes I think awards. He even said himself he got was it the Golden Rose of Montreux, I think for his coverage of the Lockerbie, Lockerbie. air disaster, yeah. which okay. was a brilliant piece of journalism. Yeah. But he used to say, "Well, uh, I'm not even interested in Sony's and things like those children's stuff." <laughs> and, and to a certain extent, he's quite right, because, you know, these people who decide whether they think you're good or not, he was, of, yes. uh, of course, absolutely no interest in them one way or the other. Didn't mean a thing to him. But yes. he was a very serious... He could. He had time... You know, he would have fitted in, if you like, uh, to Radio 4 quite comfortably. Oh, very comfortably. Very, very comfortably. And he... And, I, I mean, I think, you know, that there were times when I think he would have set the BBC into hysterics, but... Uh, <laughs> because... Because he did have very strong opinions. And, and again, I think... I I heard you saying just now he wasn't afraid to express them and I think that was perhaps his great strength as a journalist that I always felt and know that Mike could not tolerate fakes he did not like people who were pretentious he didn't like people who who said one thing and did another he couldn't he couldn't he wouldn't give the time of day to someone that he thought was in some way a fake or unreal he didn't like that mm. about any and about the... people and that was something that he never did when he was on air he actually did say what he believed they, it may be politically incorrect he may have swung you know as i say for, equally f from the far right to the far left but he did actually say what he thought and i think that was why the audience identified with him because there are many people who will think in the way that that, that mike did but feel that it's politically incorrect to say it and therefore feel that perhaps they're, they're, they're being suppressed yeah. and they don't have the right yeah. to say those things publicly without causing a public scandal or ending up in the courts but mike didn't have that inhibition <laughs> he would say what he thought and he yeah. would strike a chord with so many people whether or not they rang up and agreed with him who would sit at home and think yeah that's what i think too i, I wish i had the courage to say that yeah, the thing but i he, always thought was funny he would always he quite often and i saw several occasions him telling the management what he thought of them as well oh yes <laughs> he was not above doing that oh yes <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying to him once, he ran me and he said, I think they're trying to get rid of me. I said, well, I'm not surprised after <laughs> And then he said, well, uh, 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 uh. And yeah. he, 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 would, he would go off and he would, he would tell him, you know, you're, you're, you're running this all wrong. You're running it all wrong. The thing is, I think, that he, he, do, he did have the reputation, both on air and off air, for being a grumpy old man. But in fact, he wasn't. He had a huge sense of humour. And uh, I mean, one of the other things, about, I mean, I, I would talk to Mike on the phone probably more than I saw him in the last couple of years. But one of, one of the things that was really quite funny, I think my telephone number must have been the first one that he had in his mobile directory. <laughs> I must have been the first A in the <laughs> list of A's. And when he first got his mobile phone, I don't think he'd...